Welcome to Electron Line, and now let's take a more mathematical look at the LC circuit. So here again, we're going to use Kirchhoff's rule. We're going to go around the circuit, and as we go across the inductor in the direction of the assumed current, the voltage drop is minus L the IDT. The IDT is the change of the current respect to time. Then we go across the capacitor, the voltage drop across, across the capacitor is going to be the charge in the capacitor divided by the capacitance. And so when we go all the way around the circuit, we add it up, we should get zero voltage. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to divide both sides of the equation by negative L. If we do that, the equation then becomes the IDT is equal to one, oop, not equal to, that would be plus, because I multiply both sides by negative one, so that would be plus one over LC times Q is equal to zero. So all I did was multiply both sides by negative, that makes this positive, and then divide both sides by L, so the L disappears here, we get one over L here, and of course zero divided by L is still zero. Now the next thing we're going to do is realize that I is equal to dQ dt. It's the change in the charge per unit time, and so therefore we can replace I by dQ dt, so this becomes the second derivative, this becomes d squared Q dt squared, plus 1 over LC times Q is equal to 0. And now we realize that we have a second order differential equation of the variable Q. Now we're going to make one more change. We're going to write uh, 1 over LC as omega squared. So we're going to make a substitution. Let omega squared be equal to 1 over LC, which means that the omega is equal to 1 over the square root of L times C. The reason why we did that was when we look at this, we realize that this equation looks a lot like the equation that we use for simple harmonic motion with a spring and a mass. We get the exact same equation, and then we let omega equal to the square root of k over m, where k is the spring constant and m is the mass. So we're doing the exact same mathematical approach, and so omega then would be the angular frequency of the oscillation, keeping in mind that omega is equal to 2 pi f, so that f is equal to 1 over 2 pi times omega. And so what we see here is that we can actually figure out the frequency of oscillation of the charges going back and forth, the current going back and forth between the capacitor and inductor. We have a similar kind of an oscillatory motion, in this case with charge instead of a mass going back and forth on a spring, and the angular frequency, just like with a spring is the square root of k over m, for an LC circuit, it'll be 1 over the square root of L times C. So that's why we made that substitution. So now let's go ahead and write the equation. We're now write it as the second derivative of Q with respect to time plus omega squared times Q is equal to 0. And now we have to solve that second order differential equation. Now that's a very famous equation, and we already know what the solution to that is. The solution is such that Q as a function of time, is equal to the maximum Q times the cosine of omega t plus a phase angle. Of course, the phase angle simply means that it can start at any point in its phase. We don't have to have a phi, but to make the, make the equation general, we should write it like that. So this is the solution of the charge, for example, the charge on the capacitor as a function of time can, can be said to be total charge that we'll have on the capacitor. In the case of this, that would be total charge on the capacitor times the cosine of omega t plus phi, which means that the charge on the capacitor will vary like this over time. When q, this would be q versus time on the horizontal axis. This is maximum q, this is minus q, and as time goes on, and so that equation describes that particular relationship between the charge and the capacitor and the time as it elapses. Now you might say, well, how did he know that the solution to this equation is equal to that? Well, it turns out we can actually figure that out. What we can do here is take the first derivative of this with respect to time and see what we get. So Q prime as a function of time is equal to the first derivative of that, and of course the derivative of sine is a cosine, and the derivative of cosine is a negative sine, so this becomes minus Q times the sine of omega t plus phi times the derivative of this would be times omega, which means that we could put omega in here, and so we can do that. We can write that <coughs> q prime 
as a function of time, is equal to minus q times omega times the sine of omega t plus phi. If we now take the second derivative of both sides of the equation, we now get q double prime as a function of time is equal to the derivative sine is the cosine, so this becomes minus q omega squared times the cosine of omega t plus phi. And then if we realize that in the beginning, q times the cosine of omega t plus phi, q times the cosine of omega t plus phi, that is q to begin with, so this can be written as um, minus omega squared times q. So that means that the second derivative of q is equal to minus omega squared times q. Let's write that down. So we have q double prime. So the second derivative of q is equal to minus omega squared times q. If I now move that to the other side and set equal to 0, we can write that q double prime of t plus omega squared times q is equal to 0. And this is exactly what I had in my differential equation right here. The second derivative of q plus omega squared q equals 0. That's what I had. So what I did was I went ahead and assumed the solution, since I'm familiar with these kind of differential equations. But then I proved to you that if I take the second derivative of both sides, I get exactly what I started with, thus proving that this is indeed the solution to that. So this here now becomes the solution that describes the amount of charge you will have on your capacitor as a function of time in an LC circuit. And that is the mathematical equation that describes the, the current and the, and the charges going back and forth at that particular frequency. One more thing, we know now that omega is equal to 1 over the square root of L times C, so if you know the size of the inductor and we know the size of the capacitor, we can figure out what the angular frequency is of the oscillation going back and forth and we can then set out the frequency, which is equal to omega divided by 2 pi, or 1 over 2 pi times omega, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi times 1 over the square root of L times C. So this gives us the frequency of the oscillation of the charges going back and forth and back and forth to the capacitor on one side and the capacitor on the other side and so forth. So, and then also, if you want to know the period, that's equal to 1 over F. And that then mathematically describes an LC circuit, and you can see where the equation comes from. By simply adding up all the voltages around the circuit, writing in such a way that we can then say that omega is equal to 1 over the square root of LC, that gives us a differential equation for which we can find a solution. The solution can be proved to be correct by going ahead and taking the second derivative of both sides, and then showing that we end up with the exact same equation we started with, thus proving that this describes the oscillatory motion of the charges in an LC circuit, and that's how we do that.